from the air age through the missile age and into the age of space the shadow of the atom bomb has been across all our lives all men of goodwill earnestly hope that a realistic control of atomic weapons On January 26, 1950, one of the largest disappearances of U.S. military personnel in history occurred. 44 people boarded a Douglas C-54 Skymaster at Elmendor Air Force Base in Alaska on a routine flight to Great Falls, Montana, and despite one of the largest search and rescue efforts ever conducted by the U.S. military, none of them would ever be seen again. On that fateful day, the now missing Douglas C-54D was scheduled to fly 34 U.S. servicemen from Alaska to Montana. On board were also eight crew members, the pilot, co-pilot, an instructor pilot, a navigator, a radio operator, and three flight engineers. There were also two civilians, the wife of Master Sergeant Robert Espy, Joyce Espy, and their two-year-old son, Victor. Joyce Espy was also seven months pregnant at the time. She was flying south to Colorado to visit family there and give birth to the couple's second child. Everyone on board the plane that day would be fitted with a parachute, even Joyce Espy. Seated with her was Robert's best friend, Roy Jones, who was flying back to the lower 48 states to be discharged from the Army. Robert Espy would later state to a reporter a few days after the plane was reported missing that his last words to his wife were, if you have to jump, give the baby to Roy. The plane attempted to take off early that morning, but the engine problems caused the plane to remain at Elmendorf Air Force Base until the necessary repairs were completed. Finally, around 1 p.m. local time that day, mechanics gave the all clear for the plane, and it took to the air on its approximate eight-hour flight. The weather that day was all clear, but the temperatures were extremely cold. At ground level, the temps were around negative 25 degrees. During much of its flight that day, the C-54 followed an established air route called Airway Amber 2. This route was established during World War II and approximately follows the Alaska Highway as it snakes its way through the Canadian Rockies. In 1950, the popular air route was provided with its own radio station and an emergency airstrip about every 100 miles. The plane made regular radio contact, which was standard procedure during its flight, frequently radioing their situation reports, and everything seemed to be going just fine. At 3.09 p.m., around two hours after departure from Elmendorf Air Force Base, the C-54 made one of its routine situation reports. It stated that it was flying at approximately 10,000 feet over the town of Snag in the Yukon Territory, and that they expected to reach the next radio station located in Asia in about 30 minutes. This standard situation report would be the last time anyone ever heard from the plane. When the C-54 failed to arrive in Great Falls, the beginnings of a massive search and rescue operation was begun. When Master Sergeant Robert Espy first heard that the plane failed to land at Great Falls, he immediately took emergency leave and hitchhiked to Whitehorse to join the search for the missing plane that his pregnant wife and two-year-old son were on. He personally flew on board several rescue flights during the search. I haven't eaten or slept since Thursday. My wife and child are lost, he said in a news report that was published several days later. 
The scale of this search was aided by the fact that when the plane went missing, the United States and Canada were in the middle of conducting Exercise Sweetbriar, which was a huge joint military exercise between the two countries, and there were thousands of military personnel in the region already. The search and rescue operation was called Operation Mike, named after the pilot of the missing C-54. Operation Mike involved over 7,000 military personnel and 98 other aircraft during its several week long search. But seriously complicating the search efforts was the fact that in 1950, there was no radar coverage of this region. This critical piece of technology could have made the missing aircraft much easier to find. But instead, their search operation had to be dependent on aircraft flying over some of the most rugged terrain in all of North America and directing ground troops to search areas they may have seen something remotely resembling a crash site. But despite all of their efforts, the plane was never located. Many of the personnel involved in Operation Mike stated that poor weather seriously hampered their efforts. Only a few hours after the plane was reported missing, a large amount of snow fell over the entire region. Initially, the most promising report, which the search mainly concentrated around, was around the area of Lake Watson. A number of reports came in of residents in the area seeing flares fired into the air in this area, but nothing was ever found there. Another report sent search crews to an area along the Alaska Highway known as the Graveyard. Due to the high amount of airplane crashes during World War II as cargo planes transported supplies to Soviet Russia frequently crashed there. Near there, a group of school children said they spotted a low-flying plane at approximately 9 p.m. local time on January 26th. Nothing was ever found there either. On January 28th, a Yukon forest ranger reported that on the afternoon of January 26th, he saw a large airplane flying at around 6,000 feet near Minot. He said he heard a loud, dull thud shortly after the airplane was out of his sight, but the location of where he heard the loud thud was difficult to pinpoint for search crews. On January 30th, the main search was concentrated on an area 40 miles north of Whitehorse, where people had heard an explosion on the afternoon of the 26th. A U.S. Air Force plane had reported hearing faint radio signals in the same area. Nothing was found in this area, and on a return flight on February the 1st, the same U.S. Air Force plane did not hear any faint radio signals at the time. On February the 2nd, five Royal Canadian search aircraft were sent to search an area in northern British Columbia. The five aircraft flew out of Vancouver and were sent to investigate reports that had been received from a local settler at Beaver Lake, 40 miles northeast of Williams Lake, who had seen a large aircraft on the evening of January 26th that he described as being in trouble. He said the plane had flown directly over his cabin that afternoon, but none of the crews of the five aircraft reported seeing anything that remotely resembled a crash site. To compound this already dire situation, during the large search operation, three other aircraft, all of which were part of the search and rescue operations, also crashed. Three C-47s, two of them belonging to the U.S. Air Force and one to the Royal Canadian Air Force, all crash landed in the remote area. Luckily, all of which were quickly located and there were no fatalities in any of these crashes. The search continued until February the 14th when, in the spirit of this entire situation, a B-36 went missing along the coast of British Columbia carrying an atomic bomb. This was the United States' first broken arrow event and the entire search operation was diverted to search for this missing nuclear bomber. Of the 17 crew members on the B-36, 12 were eventually rescued. The crash site of the B-36 was not located until three years afterwards during a search mission for another lost aircraft in the region. The Texas millionaire and oil tycoon Ellis Hall went missing with his wife, two daughters, and a family friend in a plane over the region after going on vacation in southeast Alaska. The search for the Hall family lasted for a month before the plane's wreckage was located, lending even more credence to just how remote and rugged the terrain of western Canada truly is. Over 70 years later, not a single piece of the missing C-54 has ever been located. It's remarkable to even consider, especially with how many planes are accidentally found while looking for other downed aircraft in the same area. You would assume a 100-foot plane which weighs over 17 metric tons crashing in such an untouched region would be readily identifiable, but history proves this to be an incorrect assumption. There is one theory that the plane may have tried to land on a frozen lake after an emergency but the weight of the plane broke the ice, and once the plane was completely sunk under the water, the lake simply froze over within an hour or two, dimming the passengers and the crew, and completely covering the plane and any evidence that it had ever been there. 
I saw a comment on one of the articles about this disappearance that said it's possible that the plane crashed into a ravine on the side of one of the mountain ranges that are parallel to the flight path. He stated that in wintertime, if a snowstorm blew in on one of these ranges, the entire wreck site could have been covered in feet of snow within just a few hours. Another comment on the same article was by Matt Kennebec, a man that says he's been searching for the plane personally since 1999. He states in his comment that he's read the 215-page official accident report. In this report, many eyewitnesses state that they saw a plane flying unusually low, but following the Alaska Highway. One of these eyewitnesses was a truck driver named Mort Lynn, who saw a large silver plane flying at approximately 2,000 feet following the road southbound. At the same time of the sighting, Mort Lynn was between Summit and Steamboat, approximately 50 miles west of Fort Nelson, British Columbia. His sighting also fits the time frame the plane should have been over that particular area. Matt Kennebec also says in his comment that the largest cluster of eyewitnesses, over 30 of them, is along the Montana-British Columbia border. He goes on to say that he has personally interviewed four eyewitnesses who saw a large plane overfly the Kootenai River Valley late that day. Several others heard the plane or saw flares in the mountains west of the river that night and in the following days. As I looked into the Montana sightings, I found where on the evening of January 26th, there were actually reports from people in the Sparwood and Revelstroke areas of a large explosion being heard. The most reputable information came from Newgate, a town right on the U.S.-Canada border. Here, a large aircraft was seen that seemed to be in trouble and disappearing out of sight before ultimately crashing approximately near Gold Mountain. So given this last bit of information, perhaps the plane made its way much farther south, possibly even into Montana. That would explain why nothing has ever been found of the plane in the Yukon or British Columbia. But if this is true, why did the plane stop performing regular radio check-ins along its flight path? Did their radio possibly die during the flight and the pilot now unable to navigate by radio signals in the fast-fading daylight decide just to follow the Alaska Highway and fly as fast as possible until he reached the U.S.-Canada border, even pushing the plane's already troublesome engines too hard until they failed? We honestly may never know, but since the information on the plane's disappearance seemed to dry up with those reports, I will share a few tidbits of information that I also found during my research into this disappearance. Another man named Peter Lang says that he was a cartographer in his younger years in Western Canada and that he's always theorized that the plane could have crashed into a high peak in the region and an avalanche caused by the crash could have washed over its wreckage entombing it in snow. He also brings up an important point. If the last radio transmission was at 3.09 p.m. local time, that means there would have only been about an hour of daylight left and the pilot would have been flying by VFR. With no Doppler beacons to follow, he may have veered off course badly, obviously complicating search efforts greatly. Another theory I found while researching this disappearance has the plane veering off course to the south and flying over the Gulf of Alaska, a shortcut of sorts. But after having more engine problems, the plane was forced to ditch in the ocean. But if the plane was going to deviate off its planned course, the radio operator would have surely made contact, informing the ground of its modified route. Wouldn't he? No one really knows. To this day, dozens of amateur searchers and pilots continue to look for this missing plane and to date have come up with nothing. If you want to look into the modern efforts to find this missing aircraft, consider checking out the Facebook group called Operation Might. It's a group of people who are living relatives of service members that died in the crash and other curious people who just want to chat about what may have possibly happened to the missing C-54 Skymaster in January of 1950.